Hello and welcome to the 10th annual Stephen A. Schneider Memorial Lecture featuring Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali, presented by Students for Sustainable Stanford and co-sponsored by the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment. I'm one of your hosts for the evening, Tanvi. And I'm Xiaomian. And I'm Patrick. <laughs> We're so excited to have you here for this historic moment, the decennial anniversary of this lecture series. This lecture is held annually in honor of late Stanford climate scientist, Dr. Stephen H. Schneider. Uh, to introduce Dr. Schneider and his work on the 10th anniversary of this lecture series, we're excited to have with us tonight one of his former students, Dr. Michael Mastandrea. Dr. Mastandrea is a senior uh, research scholar at the Woods Institute for the Environment and chief advisor for energy and climate research at the California Energy Commission. Dr. Mastandrea. Thank you very much, Patrick. Good evening, everyone. It's my true honor and pleasure to be a part of tonight's program with Dr. Santiago Ali and to kick off this 10th annual Stephen Schneider lecture by speaking briefly in honor of Steve as one of his students here at Stanford, as you heard. I first met Steve Schneider in 1997 as a sophomore when, uh, here at Stanford when, when I asked to meet him and to learn about his climate science research. And as anyone who ever met Steve knows, talking to him was kind of like drinking from a fire hose. He, he rapidly rattled off an overview of climate change science and the need for action, a deconstruction of the arguments of climate change deniers, and an invitation to take his course on climate modeling and theory the next quarter. I, I did take that course and, and Steve became over time my mentor and, and a friend as I completed my undergraduate studies and then stayed on at Stanford to pursue my PhD on climate science and policy in the EIPER program. And we continued to be close collaborators in research and through the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Process until Steve's death in 2010. Steve was a brilliant scientist, a, a pioneer in climate change research who also possessed a unique talent for both explaining complex scientific issues and encouraging others to care about them. And his scientific training came within a tradition where outreach beyond the scientific community was viewed as compromising scientific objectivity. And Steve challenged this paradigm and often said that, that scientists are also citizens with an obligation to carefully separate scientific facts and personal opinions but also to speak out about both. Throughout his career, he worked tirelessly to inform the public and policymakers about the science of climate change, the risks it poses, and the urgency and opportunities for solutions. You can find a, a trove of Steve's outreach as well as videos of Steve in action on his website, climatechange.net. Steve was deeply committed not only to public outreach, but also to interdisciplinary education for the next generation of scientists and leaders. Here at Stanford, he championed interdisciplinary environmental science and policy programs at both the undergrad and graduate level, like Earth Systems and EIPER, as well as science literacy training for all students. And I think Steve would be extremely proud to see how this annual lecture in his honor has become the largest climate lecture on campus over the past decade, bringing people together from across campus to focus not only on climate science, but also climate solutions and equity and environmental justice as key parts of that. I want to thank our hosts from Students for a Sustainable Stanford for inviting me to speak and, and I'll now hand it back to them. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful and touching speech, Dr. Master Andrea. And with that introduction, we are excited to share a very special surprise tonight. Every year at this lecture, we've shown a video made in 2010 honoring Dr. Schneider's legacy. And tonight, we are excited to premiere a new video in memory of Dr. Schneider with the last decade of climate action and paying tribute to 10 years of the Schneider Lecture. We hope you enjoy. Before we get any further. Sorry. Yeah, that was an amazing video and it's a real honor to be a part of this legacy. Before we get any further and introduce our keynote speaker for the evening, we wanna first thank a few people and groups who've been instrumental in this process. First, Dr. Terry Root, researcher, educator, and wife of the late Dr. Schneider, 
who has been a constant presence throughout the process and helped us conceptualize the lecture from the very beginning. We'd also like to thank CS Plus Social Good, the Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity Department, the Environmental Justice Working Group, and Sanford Earth Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for their kind support. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for. We are so excited to have Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali here with us tonight. Dr. Santiago Ali is a personal hero for many of us. A leader in environmental justice, a renowned activist and speaker, he worked at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency for 24 years before resigning to found the Hip Hop Caucus, where he led their work on climate, environmental justice, civic engagement, and more. His advocacy focuses on revitalizing the most vulnerable communities and securing health, economic, and environmental justice. We ask that you silence your phones and devices for the duration of the lecture. After the keynote address, we will be taking audience questions. People with questions who are in the room with us tonight can line up at the lectern in front. Online attendees can submit their questions using the Zoom Q&A feature located in the menu bar at the bottom or top of your screen. And without further ado, we'd like to invite Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali to the virtual stage to deliver his lecture, From Surviving to Thriving. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's such an honor and a blessing to be here with you. I, I wish I was there in person uh, to be able to actually uh, hold space with everyone. Um, you know, this is a, is a transformational moment. And, you know, our 10th anniversary honoring Dr. Schneider uh, and, and all the amazing work that he did. He was a transformational figure. Um, and, you know, he was willing to, to push the envelope. He was willing to build partnerships. He was willing to utilize communication in a different way, especially from a scientific paradigm. And we need more transformational individuals, um, both in this moment and with the coming sets of challenges and opportunities that are in front of us. Um, I would like to pay honor also uh, to the Pamunkey and the Mattapanai whose land that I currently reside on. And I would also like to thank all of the environmental justice and civil rights leaders um, who have dedicated their lives uh, to making sure that justice, equality uh, becomes a reality, uh, both in the environmental and climate, housing, transportation, economic, and so many other contexts. Um, so we wanna make sure that we are paying honor to them. You know, as we begin this journey of how do we help to revitalize vulnerable communities? How do we make sure that we're making transformative change happen? Uh, I'm reminded uh, of a couple of aspects. You know, in our conversation today, I, I wanna make sure that we talk about power sharing. I wanna talk about policy and communication. I wanna talk about the clean economy and just transition. Uh, youth and culture. You see, all of these things are a part of sustainability. They are all going to be incredibly necessary also as we uh, address the climate crisis uh, and making sure that we are dealing with the impacts that are happening. But if we think critically, if we build authentic collaborative partnerships, we can also make sure that opportunities become a reality, not for just some of the people, but we can make sure that everyone has an opportunity to move uh, from surviving to thriving, something that I often share. I, I wanna take a moment um, and also share with you uh, a few of the images that I think are important when we have this conversation about climate change, about climate justice, because we often um, miss how we actually got to this place in history. So if you'll give me one second, I wanna pull this up for you. And I wanna take a quick journey with you. And, and I'm gonna move as quickly as possible because I know we're gonna have a lot of questions, but I think we gotta get the foundation underneath of us, um, both of how we got here uh, and where we are going. So if I hit these buttons properly, you know, as a young boy, uh, my father was an engineer, but he also was a person who was wedded into history. And he used to share with me, and I would often have to uh, you know, share back with him you know, some of the foundational pieces uh, that our country stands on. You know, when we say we find these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal and endowed with certain unalienable rights, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know, whether we're talking about our constitution, our bill of rights, or a number of the other 
you know, critical elements that we stand upon, there is a set of expectations that come with those words, that they have real meaning. And not only is that meaning, um, you know, it's beyond just a theoretical construct, it is actually something that we have to one day be able to feel and touch uh, and experience for ourselves. And when I think about how important those words are, how they have been a beacon um, to bring people to our country in, in many different ways, I'm also reminded of the fact that we have to also be willing to have some tough conversations about how we got here, uh, who have been the folks who have been unseen and unheard and often forgotten, who have been the ones that have carried the burden that got us to this moment. And I think about the amazing, the amazing civil rights icon, writer, humanist, uh, and so many other labels, James Baldwin. He once said that if I love you, I have to make you conscious of the things you don't see. We often don't see the impacts that have happened and still today continue to happen to vulnerable communities. We often don't see the impacts that are happening from the climate crisis. We often don't see the dots and connect them to have a better understanding of not only how we got here, but a North Star, a pathway forward, if you will. So we have to have real talk because real talk helps us to understand you know, how we got here. How did policy play a role in some of the impacts that are going on, but also how do we change and move that policy in a positive direction? You know, we have, we have two different ways of looking at this. You know, policy can uplift. It can be transformational, like the work um, that Steve did, or it can also be detrimental uh, and can cause ripples that go move throughout history and play out in a number of different ways. And we know that our indigenous brothers and sisters who lived in harmony with the environment uh, for millennia, policy justified removing them from their traditional lands. And we also understand that the climate crisis is going to move people if we don't begin to address many uh, of the sets of challenges that are going on. We also know they were taken away from their traditional foods for those of us who work on food justice issues. And we also understand that unfortunately they were exposed to a number of pathogens, um, both on the Trail of Tears and even before then. So we understand that these dynamics that we see play out in relationship to climate um, and environmental injustice were playing out even at that time. And the thing that I wanna point out to folks, and we will talk about how we address this, is that it was policy that justified all of these types of actions. And it was our government that also at that time that was supportive uh, of these types of actions. We also understand that policy played, you know, the, the main role in actually bringing um, brothers and sisters from Africa and enslaving them in this country and having a number of similar dynamics, bringing them here for free labor, for those of us who work on uh, worker justice issues. And we also understand the brutality that was in that space. We understand, um, you know, the stripping away of culture and also a number of other dynamics that are in that space. But again, it was policy that justified these types of actions. It was policy that also said that we need to begin to build a better, faster, more efficient infrastructure in our country. And many of our Chinese brothers and sisters played a significant role in that space and being able to help us to move uh, forward uh, into the next century. But we also know even with all of that dedication and hard work, that we had things like the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, that after the, the great work was done, we then said, you know, we don't necessarily need you here or more from people from your country coming here. So we gotta understand the duality that often exists inside of policy. Policy with Jim Crowism also began, you know, the segregation of people, the pushing of people into certain communities and the disinvestments that happened in that space whether we're talking about transportation justice or housing justice or a number of these other elements that are also, yes, connected to the climate uh, crisis um, and the sets of opportunities that also exist in helping to rectify many of the injustices of the past. And as we begin to move a little further, we also understand that our Japanese brothers and sisters also because of policy had to deal with a number of different dynamics. Um, you know, um, being placed in internment camps, 
and being uh, stripped away of their land and a number of other dynamics that were driven by policy. Now, we also understand that policy is still playing out today. When we look at redlining and how folks were moved into certain areas uh, and reinforcing of those who were already there and the packing in of individuals um, and the dynamics that play out in that space of actually these discriminatory practices placing what we now find for many people living in flood zones and living in these areas where there have been a number of fossil fuel facilities and other things packed into those communities. And of course, we will talk about that connection to the climate crisis or restrictive covenances where people couldn't um, you know, live in certain communities uh, and then they couldn't escape other communities. And that begins the conversation about the sacrifice zones um, that we find across our country and the additional sets of challenges and impacts that happen in those areas from both environmental injustice and the climate crisis. And the last part that is a part of this equation um, of impacts that we see going on today is of course zoning. And we know that certain communities are zoned differently than other communities. Uh, once again, allowing the packing uh, in black and brown and lower wealth communities with fossil fuel facilities and other undesirable uh, land use uh, practices that, that continue to go on. And of course, other brothers and sisters, you know, have more pristine communities uh, that are protected and invested in in a different way, in a different level. But we also understand that in, our mo in this moment that we need heroes. Children need heroes, but we do as well. And we have heroes from the past and we have heroes in the present and we're gonna need even more of them as we move forward in addressing these sets of opportunities that we have in front of us. You know, it's interesting that when we go back and look at history, you know, that women were told to, you know, that you shouldn't own land, that you shouldn't be able to vote, that you shouldn't be able to do so many different things. But luckily women said, you know what? not going to hear that and we're going to continue to push and we're going to make sure that we are building authentic partnerships and that we are going to make real change happen. It was a part of people saying that I'm willing to stand up and, and I'm willing to be a part uh, of change. In the civil rights movement as well, we saw the impacts of Jim Crowism uh, and a number of other aspects in policy, but we also know that men and women of good conscience are willing to come together. Men and women of different faiths, uh, of different religions, of different hues uh, can come together to make real change happen. And I'm reminded of 1968, when you see I am a man, that particular picture that's there, Dr. King was in Memphis, Tennessee. He was there to work with the sanitation workers um, and to help to fight for better wages, but also better working conditions because many of them were being exposed uh, to a number of different things that were a part of the refuge system at that time. And then I'm also reminded when we th start to think about heroes, those early, early leaders uh, in the environmental movement um, and how with rivers catching on fire, uh, the Cuyahoga River, uh, places across our country where you looked up and you couldn't see the sky because there was so much pollution in the air, there were young people who came together and pushed for that early environmental movement, which out of that came, you know, the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and RICRA and a number of other really important landmark pieces of environmental legislation that in many instances um, gives us a foundation to stand on. So when I think about Dr. Schneider, I think about you know, all these early leaders who are willing to push and go beyond the limits um, to begin that long, long journey toward making change happen and making sure that justice becomes a reality. But in today's time, we also have amazing leaders who are building authentic collaborative partnerships, who are working and creating legislation, uh, who are doing all of the things that are necessary uh, to make sure that we have a stronger movement. And I would be remiss if I didn't call out the fact that when you look at uh, the majority of the folks who have been doing the work, uh, of course, uh, in, around women's suffrage, around civil rights, and around the environmental movement, it is women 
who have really truly been the ones on the forefront, who have been doing the hard work behind the scenes, often not getting the recognition in front of the scenes, um, who um, have built this strong foundation and who are actually holding up the movement. These are elders as well as youth. And I wanted to just share with you all also just a, another set of pictures of these just amazing, amazing individuals, both in our country and outside of our country who are making change happen. Now, when we think about why we do the work that we do, whether it is focusing on climate or environmental justice, sustainability, uh, or a number of other areas, for many of us, we fight both for this generation but especially for the younger generation and for generations to come. And when we think about that, there are images that automatically pop out in our head about things that have gone on and things that we are stop, trying to diligently stop from happening. We think about, when we hear the words Flint, we automatically think about the injustices that happened to that community uh, and to the little children who are gonna be impacted from lead and the neurological problems and a number of other dynamics that will go on uh, throughout their life because one of policy, the other is race and a number of other dynamics that were drivers in that space. I want you all to do me a favor. I wish I was there with you, but I want you to take a deep breath. I want you to just pull it in, hold on to it for a second. And now I just want you to let it out. Now, you know, that is an autonomic response. The average person takes in about 20,000 breaths a day. The question becomes the communities that we live in. For some people, that autonomic response brings something positive into their body. It is life-giving and we, we need it. But for other communities, to take that breath in means to breathe toxins into your body, to be moving forward with the shortening of your life. You know, we got over 200,000 people who die prematurely from air pollution every year in our country. More people are dying from air pollution than are dying from gun violence. More people are dying from air pollution than are dying from car crashes. More people are dying from air pollution than are dying from overdoses of drugs. That same air pollution that black and brown, indigenous and lower wealth communities are dealing with every day is that same air pollution that is playing a role in warming up of our oceans and of our atmosphere and playing a role also um, in the climate crisis that we all work so diligently to address. But sometimes we don't think about those communities who have had to carry the burden for decades upon decades upon decades um, of that air pollution and those facilities that are located extremely close to their communities. Now we've got 24 million folks in our country, 7 million children and African-American and Latinx children are the ones who are going to the emergency rooms and the ones who are losing their lives. And we know that the climate crisis will exacerbate that air pollution, which will therefore exacerbate the individuals who are dealing with breathing difficulties. All of us who've just you know, navigated the COVID-19 pandemic understand you know, how pre-existing medical conditions can make us vulnerable in so many different ways. And of course, we know certain communities due to their exposures um, have had a much more difficult time in being able to navigate it. People have been losing their lives. People, of course, had to go to the emergency rooms and a number of other dynamics. And when we look at communities like the 48217 in Michigan, I grew up in two places. I grew up in Appalachia and I grew up in Michigan. You know, this is the, one of the most polluted zip codes uh, across our country. When the kids look out their windows, instead of seeing trees and green space, they see facilities and the flaring that's going on. And they also, in many instances are having to navigate the medical devices and situations that far too often are impacting their young bodies, making it more difficult to learn. And of course, the climate crisis will exacerbate this. In places like Baltimore, where young people have been pushing and fighting back, building partnerships um, to stop a number of different polluting facilities from coming in to their communities of 
causing a toxic loading where there's one industry and then another and then another and then another. You know, it just places these huge burdens on their bodies. And of course, it is also contributing to the climate crisis. Sometimes we think, well, we can just escape to those beautiful, pristine locations, you know, whether it is, you know, national parks or a number of other public lands. But over the last few years, there have been studies that have shown that air pollution is increasing, that uh, impacts from the climate crisis are also increasing. So we understand that there is a direct connection to what is happening in black and brown uh, in lower wealth communities and also what is happening in our natural spaces. And we have to work diligently to be able to address these. And then you have places like the Manchester community in Houston, Texas, a hardworking Latinx community doing everything right. But when you go there and you roll down the windows of your car, you feel like you're breathing in gasoline fumes because the community is surrounded by petrochemical facilities and the flaring and then in the emissions that are coming out of those stacks, of course, are playing a role with the climate crisis. But these communities have to deal with this 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And the only time that they get a break is when there is a hurricane, which is a part of the climate crisis comes through. So then those particular plants, of course, do something called start up and shut down where they push huge amounts of pollution out and they shut down and then they come back on uh, once the, that particular storm has passed through. But the communities are the ones that are dealing with these impacts. That's Cesar Chavez High School. And you see the track there, you see the kids who are out there playing. So they're getting all these multiple impacts now. They get the impacts from pollution and they also get the impacts from the climate crisis. And this is another shot there uh, in the Manchester community. And the interesting dynamic there is, and it's hard for many of us to actually understand, is that you can literally stand in people's front yards and backyards, reach your hand out, and you can touch the piping that exists in these facilities. And of course, there are all kinds of medical conditions that are uh, part of the exposures that individuals are dealing with from the chemicals. So I thought I'd bring it on over to California as well in the diesel death zone that is there. And you can see once again, the impacts that are happening. We understand the direct connections between climate change and what these folks are breathing and experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. And yet folks still have to live. Folks are still doing what they can to be able um, to experience being outdoors. And of course, now uh, folks are also dealing with extreme temperatures and they're dealing with a number of other parts that are connected to the climate crisis. And we shared, you know, a little bit about what's going on in relationship to air pollution. Clean air is a human right, but so is clean water. And we understand the impacts that are happening to our water bodies all across our planet, both from pollution and also from the climate crisis. But I want to call this out for everybody. You know, there's over 2.4 million miles of fossil fuel pipeline in our country right now. There's actually a little more than that because there's been some additional that has been built over the last couple of years. And it is carrying, um, of course, part of the drivers, whether we're talking about oil or natural gas. Um, and that is enough pipeline to go to the moon and back twice. So when you see individuals um, who are part of these pipeline fights, um, protecting water, they are also trying to address the climate crisis by saying enough is enough. It's time for us to be able to transition away from fossil fuels. This is a part of the Line 5 fight that's currently going on in the Great Lakes area. And, and because I'm so connected to culture and, and folks heard, you know, uh, about my time at the Hip Hop Cau Caucus, Reverend Yearwood um, actually is the founder uh, of the Hip Hop Caucus. Um, I thought it was important that we also make sure that when we're talking about culture, we're also talking about those creatives who are willing to get engaged, to be a part uh, of the partnerships that are necessary, um, to make sure that we understand that there's power inside of culture. And you see many of the folks whom you probably know uh, from their movies, uh, TV, and some of them also uh, from their work that they do on the music side of the equation. And this is the Bayou Pipeline, which is a huge fight that's currently going on. And we talked a little bit about Flint 
And this is Little Miss Flint. Now, Little Miss Flint, you know, has grown up, um, you know, dealing with the water crisis that's going on, trying to make sure that it is affordable and accessible um, and that it is also safe and science comes in. So science also plays a role, not only in helping us to have an understanding of the chemical compositions that may be inside of our water and at what level, but science also has to play a role along with others and how we communicate where things are um, and help people to feel more confident in the decisions um, and often tough decisions that they have to be able to make. Now, when we think about Flint, there is also a water crisis that is currently going on in Benton Harbor, Michigan. What folks might not know is there are over 3000 locations across our country that have higher levels of lead in their water than Flint did. And we understand the tragedy that was Flint. And now in Benton Harbor, Michigan, they have uh, just super high levels um, currently um, of lead that's inside of their water. And I bring these uh, contexts up around water because we understand that with these additional stressors that the climate crisis brings, you know, these uh, historic floods, these um, elevated, elevated, uh, you know, amounts of rain that continue and these, these deluges that continue to happen, that they're placing these stressors that then raise the cost of water um, for many communities who are often already paying sometimes a third, sometimes 50% of, um, you know, of their take home pay uh, around utilities. And we often don't see or think about the connections between what's happening in everyday people's lives and what's going on with the climate crisis. I also wanted to highlight that even in these moments where we see lots of challenges that are going on, there are so many amazing young people and other organizations that are actually doing everything that they can to not only address the injustices, the environmental injustices that are happening, but also beginning to move forward on innovative solutions to water quality issues that are happening um, across you know, our country. Uh, this is Wawa, the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance. Uh, these, these kids are just amazing. They're also a, a part of the Earth Tomorrow crew um, who go into a number of different tributaries uh, and help with cleanups and, and put new measures in place to capture, you know, whether it is trash or a number of other things. Um, so that there's not as many stressors uh, on the uh, water systems um, across the areas that they work. And then, of course, everybody knows that we've got this dynamic that's going on right now with plastic pollution and a number of other um, impacts that, you know, by the year we time we get to close to 2050, they're estimated there may be more trash in our oceans than there is fish. Um, so we have to be really, really mindful of that as we're moving forward. We also understand the algae blooms um, are also connected to not only the runoff that's currently going on, but also to the changes in temperatures. Temperatures go up. We know that there's also additional impacts that are happening to algae blooms and a number of other things uh, across our country. I, I wanted to bring this into our conversation um, because I think, you know, what Mother Teresa you know, was sharing with us, you know, is, is the power that each and every one of us has. You know, we often have difficulty in, in sharing power and understanding that that is one of the ways that we can actually begin to build stronger partnerships, to make sure that we are honoring the voices um, of everyone who is a part of a process. And that when we do that, we actually have the ability um, to enhance things, to make sure that it is more sustainable, to make sure that there's a real anchoring around the work and those good times uh, or challenging times that folks will stick and stay because they see themselves reflected and they know that they are being honored and that by coming together, that they have the ability to actually make real change happen. And the reason that we need that in this moment um, is because of all these different stressors that we know are now out there. There are stressors to our bodies, there are stressors to our minds, and, and I would even be one to say that there are stressors to a, the spiritual side of our equation because of the things that we are dealing with. But there 
are also opportunities for us uh, to mitigate and hopefully be able to one day end these uh, impacts that are happening and, and strengthen our mind, body, and spirit at the same time. So when we see things like Hurricane Irma or the hurricanes uh, that have been hitting a number of different locations, um, and when we look at the folks who are often forgotten, you know, when we look at people who are in the Virgin Islands, um, and even in Puerto Rico, after the storms are gone, after the cameras are gone, we often forget about the challenges that are left behind, about the folks who are still trying to get traction, about the folks who are still trying to be able to navigate bureaucracies um, and, and to continue to get people to partner um, and to not embrace their humanity and still to care. I, I call out my sister Beyonce um, because she continues to show up um, both in, in times, in these challenging times when natural disasters happen and in other times and making sure that she is investing, you know, her platform, investing resources in a number of other dynamics. Um, our, our sister Rihanna just the other day, you know, also uh, made sure that she was utilizing a number of different resources that are a part um, of her suite uh, to also continue to help to make real change happen. Um, and to give people the tools and resources that they need to be able to address the issues that are happening inside of their communities. Um, I often think about uh, my family back in Puerto Rico um, and others uh, and how they were often unseen um, and how folks began to share misinformation about the dynamics that were happening in their communities from the climate crisis, but yet they still uh, continue to push on and individuals like Fat Joe and Daddy Yankee and a number of others were willing to step up um, and make sure that they kept attention and focus. They were building real partnerships um, to, to make sure that folks had the things that they needed to make change happen. They were also addressing policy um, in that space and working with legislators um, to make sure that the right types of information and the right types of actions would be uh, integrated into some of the pieces uh, of legislation moving forward. And then of course, we've all seen these floods that are happening all across our country. And again, connected to the climate crisis, connected to the environmental injustices of the past. And I'm reminded because I spent time and used to live a little bit in New York of these different dynamics that we're, we're now seeing, You know, whether it is our transportation systems, that picture there on the left-hand side is the New York uh, subway um, and, and how the waters were so high um, that for some folks it was up to their neck. And of course, elders were stuck in that situation. And even out on the streets, um, the immense flooding that's going on, um, again, because of these, these, you know, these, these rains that continue to happen at levels that we haven't seen. You know, before we used to look at 100-year floods, 50-year floods, and now we're looking at 500-year floods um, in locations across our country. And it's all because of many of the decisions that we've made in the past, and hopefully we will fix them here in the future. Uh, I wanna call this out real quickly. I know folks in California understand the devastating effects that forest fires have. But once again, there are those who are unseen and unheard in these situations. And if you look, you will find these brothers and sisters who are still out in the fields working even as the flames were raging, as the incineration was happening, these were the individuals who are on the front lines um, in these types of situations. And we have to make sure that their voices are a part of the sets of solutions um, as we move forward. Now, even though we've had these, these challenging situations and we continue to, um, and we're spending, you know, now hundreds of billions of dollars on the sets of events that have gone on. There is a pathway forward if we choose to embrace that pathway. Young people understand the direction to move. Now, a number of other frontline communities understand the direction that we can move and how we can make sure that we actually win on many of these issues. One of them is making sure there's a just transition and a new clean economy. As we break that addiction to fossil fuels and we begin to move away, there are huge sets of opportunities if through intentionality, we make sure uh, that the communities have been carrying the burdens 
uh, the communities that have often been unseen and unheard um, have not just a seat at the table, but have an opportunity to actually significantly benefit both their health and wealth as we go forward. And when we talk about a just transition, we are talking about a number of different folks being a part of that process. You know, it is about a set of principles. It is about a set of practices. It is about moving away from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy. It is about our healthcare system. It is about our financial system, our environmental system, our housing, our transportation, um, and making sure that we have a set of holistic strategies moving forward that I'm sure we'll talk a bit more about. It, it is about, you know, when I drive home to see my mother, and I drive through Western Maryland and I look up on the mountainside and I see these giant uh, wind mills that are there. And I drive literally about another 400, 500 yards. I'm on the West Virginia side uh, of the border and I look at, back at those exact same mountains that are on that side and you don't see those. It, you know, it is about wind and thermal and tidal uh, and a number of other sets of opportunities that the new clean economy provides for us. It is about place-based work that transforms communities. It helps them to become more resilient. It helps them to also adapt to some of the impacts that are both happening um, and will be coming. It is about making sure that we are honoring the voices of communities um, because communities speak for themselves. It is about Projects like the Regenesis Project in Spartanburg, South Carolina, that was able to take a $20,000 environmental justice small grant and leverage it into over $300 million in changes. It is about being able to take old shotgun housing where you're paying three to $400 a month for your electricity costs and bringing in 500 new green homes where you lower people's electricity costs down to 60 to $65 a month and also build wealth at the same time and play your part in helping to address the climate crisis. It is also about cleaning up brownfields and Superfund sites in that same community. And now having a 35 acre solar farm which zeroes out people's electricity costs and also creates jobs and new sets of opportunities. It is also about the folks who went through worker training programs who are now starting their own businesses and being able uh, to create a whole new set of opportunities uh, for folks who come from their communities and beyond. It is about you know, our STEM schools and making sure that young black and brown uh, and indigenous uh, youth have the opportunity to be prepared for the 21st century to bring their innovation and ingenuity into the mix um, and, and create the next set of opportunities that will help us to be able to move forward. It is also about making sure that as we are doing this work, that we understand that a new clean economy is going to require folks who look like uh, what America will be looking like. So it's folks like the Green Door Initiative in Detroit, Michigan, run by Miss Donnell Wilkins, who uh, takes uh, returning citizens uh, and students that folks often haven't seen value in, taking them through these worker training programs. And she has the highest rate of job placement of any of the job placement uh, and training programs uh, in the Midwest. And making sure that, that folks are ready for this new set of opportunities. You know, if we're going to win, on the climate crisis. We need to have activism and advocacy. Dr. Schneider understood the value of making sure that when we are talking about climate, that we are talking about people. He understood that if we can mobilize enough folks, if we can get enough people to understand and be connected to science, that there was nothing that we could not achieve. And that's why when you see the Women's March, and you, of course you had a bunch of men who said a million women would never come together. And of course, sisters was like, oh yeah, I got something for you. And not only did a million women come together, but they also took that energy back home. 
And they said, if I can't find somebody to run for office, who will do the right thing? If I can't find somebody who will represent my communities, I'll do it myself. And that's why we now have so many amazing women who are working on Capitol Hill and in state houses and county commissions, on school boards and a number of other locations because folks said, I can be the one to help to make change happen. The People's Climate March was another example of how we get advocacy and activism and you know, millions of young people and others together to say that we can and will make the 21st century look different than the 20th century was. In this moment, we have to honor science. We went through four years of science denial and misinformation. Steve understood that you have to address those issues. And some of the best people to do that, of course, are the individuals who are working in the various science fields. Science is our foundation, science and the law, and of course, people. When we have the three of those things come together, there is absolutely nothing that we cannot do. We can make sure that we save our planet and we can save ourselves at the exact same time. And science can help us to be able to achieve that. But we can't do it without young people. Young people have played a role in every social movement in our country and have made it stronger and better. And there are thousands of youth-led organizations across our planet that are leaning in. They're saying that I want to make sure that my future is brighter and more inclusive. The sins of the past will not be the sins of the future. And that is the beauty of the youth movement that is going on across our country. And I would be remiss if I didn't also share with you that one of the reasons that we are seeing a, a, a much needed focus on racial injustice issues and how they are connected to so many different elements of our life, but that we can also make sure that we are addressing those and making the change has to come from the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, folks have seen the injustices that were happening. And the beauty of the Black Lives Matter movement was that you saw African-American brothers and sisters, you saw white brothers and sisters, you saw Latinx brothers and sisters and indigenous brothers and sisters and AAPI brothers and sisters, and you saw the LGBTQIA community and elders and others all coming together and saying that change can and will happen. When we have all these movements, when we have all this activism and advocacy coming together, we can influence policy. We can influence economic opportunities. We can help to heal our country. We can actually help to heal the planet. And we can make sure that we finally have legislation in place on the federal and the state and the county and the local level that meets the needs of the moment and prepares us for the future. We have things like the Environmental Justice for All Act, um, which just got reintroduced. President Biden has built a framework for us to be able to have the resources and the structure that is necessary for us to address the climate crisis, for us to address environmental injustice, for us to protect our natural spaces and so many other elements. Whether we're talking about EJ40, making sure that 40% of the benefits are making it to vulnerable communities, or if we're talking about our infrastructure bill, helping to address the crumbling infrastructure that has been happening across our country with roads and bridges and airports and getting broadband in place and a number of other elements that are gonna be so necessary because we have to build it for the 21st century uh, to make sure that we have what's necessary. Whether we're talking about EVs or charging stations or, a, or rebuilding the grid, all of these things are going to be incredibly necessary and science and engineering is going to play a huge, huge part in making sure that we have that across our country. This is the moment that we find ourselves. In. This is a moment where we get a chance to protect our public lands, where we protect those um, places that have been blessed um, by you know, the Most High. This is our moment. This is an opportunity for us to better embrace culture and to make sure that we are lifting it up, whether we're talking about the divest invest movement where trillions of dollars have now been divested or the work that we've done over at the Hip Hop Caucus, understanding that if we are going to make all of these things become a reality, we have to protect the vote. Never tell anybody who to vote for, but we understand 
that if we make sure that everyone has the opportunity to fully participate in the civic process, that they will make sure that they are getting individuals into these positions of power who are focused on the climate crisis, who are focused on environmental injustice, who are focused on rebuilding the infrastructure that's necessary, making sure that the resources are making it to the spaces and places that have often been overlooked. We also understand to be able to do that, you gotta have music and you've gotta have the arts because it builds bridges between communities. Everyone remembers their favorite song. They remember how it makes them feel. And when you can infuse this work on climate and environmental justice with music and other forms of art, you have an opportunity to touch people um, and to have us to begin to make sure that we are embracing our humanity. And a part of that is making sure that individuals who come from and are connected to culture are playing a role in helping us to move forward. And we do it because of the next generation. We do it to make sure that our world is more safe and sustainable. We do it um, so that the babies don't have to deal with the same sets of impacts that are happening now because we understand what the dynamics will be that we don't make the investments, if we don't lean in, if we don't have collaborative partnerships in this moment, if we don't get the right policies in place, if we don't support science, then there's a whole set of additional challenges that these babies will have to deal with. But we also understand, and my grandmother always shares with me, that when you know better, do better, and that we have power unless we give it away. Let's utilize our power to make sure that we are uplifting those who have often not been at the table or those who have not been able to actually help to frame things out or those who have not been the ones who have been receiving the resources that are so needed. Let's make sure that our academic institutions are really real partnerships with communities and frontline organizations. And let's make sure that we are lifting up our young people and making sure that they have the foundation um, and, and the foundation underneath of them to be able to do the work that they are already doing and doing it on an even bigger and broader stage. I'm Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali. I wanna thank you all for allowing me to be a part of this 10th anniversary. Uh, thank you all um, for honoring uh, Dr. Schneider and the work that he did and the legacy that lives on in each and every one of you. And thank you for your commitment and being a part of real change. Thank you for the amazing lecture, Dr. Santiago Ali. Now we will move on to the audience Q&A. So again, if you're here in the auditorium here with us tonight, you may line up at the aisle to my right side and come up to the lectern to ask your question. And if you're online, please submit your questions through the Zoom Q&A function. And Tommy will read your question aloud for Dr. Santiago Gali. Amazing. Yeah, so thank you guys so much for joining us. That was an incredible lecture. I've learned so much tonight. Um, our first question is from Emily on the virtual Q&A. Um, she said, I'd like to refer to the slide regarding to the number of deaths due to air pollution. I don't think you created the poster image in that slide, but it says air pollution costs money and lives. I'm concerned about the fact that money is listed before people's lives. And I feel like this is a very telling example about the way people prioritize things. How do we flip that? How do we get people to realize that the lives are the priority, not the money? Well, the lives are always the number one, um, you know, the number one anchoring point. Uh, especially for those of us who work um, an environmental justice paradigm. You know, we often talk about, uh, we have a situation where there is profit over people, um, but we also want to help people to understand that um, when we don't protect people's lives, that there is a cost. Of course, there's the cost of loss of life, but we also understand that when we allow people to continually be exposed to toxic air pollution, that there are healthcare costs that are associated with that. When we um, also don't address the air pollution, we understand that people's housing values go down, which has an impact on their life as well. And there are a number of other dynamics that are out there. Um, so I apologize if the, it was given any uh, 
misinformation uh, um, with uh, what the slide, the slide that may have been there, um, but by no means do we ever place uh, profit before people. Hello, my name is Lainey. Thank you so much for your time and all of um, the words that you've said today. It's been very insightful. Um, I was hoping you could help me with a question that I've been grappling with um, studying Earth systems here at Stanford. I feel like a lot of the scientific dialogue around the climate crisis is highly focused on research and sometimes um, heavily removed from the actual communities that are most affected by the crisis itself. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts about balancing the need for research in this conversation, but also the need for um, a sense of humanity and culture that is often lacking or overlooked in um, the modern westernized scientific theory. Mm -hmm. um, and if this relates at all to your work um, with the hip hop caucus and the arts in general. Yeah, well, it, it, it equates to my work in a number of different ways. I'm also uh, currently the interim chief of programs at the Union of Concerned Scientists. So I work with you know top scientists all the time. And, and we're often, you know, in these conversations of helping people to understand that when we operate uh, science in silos, um, it is often disconnected uh, from what's happening in everyday people's lives. It, that's usually the, you know, the afterthought um, or that comes into the equation later on. You know, uh, part of that is the paradigms that we operate in. We have to expand our paradigms. We have to make sure that traditional environmental knowledge is a part uh, of the science base of information that we are utilizing. We also have to make sure that citizen science, or some would say community-based participatory research, um, is also a part. And when we start to bring all of these elements in, then we'll also be more anchored to what's happening inside of communities. Um, we have to have a holistic way uh, of coming together and addressing many of the challenges and sets of opportunities that are there. When we don't, science becomes mystical. And I know scientists would like to say, well, no, of course it's not mystical, Mustafa, you know, we're dealing with, uh, you know, X's and Y's and zeros and ones. Um, but if everyday folks don't feel connected, if everyday folks um, are not understanding what's uh, being shared or analyzed, then we are missing I feel a critical component um, of our work and, and opportunities, as Dr. Schneider would have said, um, of actually building bridges um, between communities uh, and information. Um, so that's the way that I approach it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lainey, and thank you for your answer. Um, we have another virtual question. Anonymous asked, I think a cultural shift towards community care instead of individualism is needed in order to move toward environmental justice. In what ways can policy, measure, can policy measures change our culture? And well, policy, uh, and I spent some time on Capitol Hill. You know, it's interesting. It, we're at a, a different time now, so let me just make sure I, I say that part first. So if we were creating, when we're creating policy, if we had folks who took a look at uh, principles of environmental justice, those 17 principles for environmental justice that were created in 1991 at the first People of Color Summit, if the HEMES principles uh, and a number of, the, uh, of a few other of those really important sets of documents that many of us utilize were a part of the policy paradigm, then we would be in a much better position. Here's the other part. This gets tough for folks, especially folks who you know, are, are really smart or they think they're really smart. Um, I'm always amazed when we create policy that folks aren't asking for. Let that sink in for a second because policy should be driven by a set of needs that folks want addressed. Um, so we have to also think really critically about that. Now, yes, there are always projections of things that are coming that people might not know about and we wanna be prepared for that. But that also means that there's some work that needs to be done in sitting down with folks beforehand um, and, and starting to work through some things um, so that there's a real value added by you know, the investments that uh, individuals uh, or entities are making uh, in this space. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Acacia. Um, I had a question. You mentioned 
about the short attention span, especially in relation to media and like natural disasters. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how we can actually um, get and keep people's attention and how we can keep the movements for change going, especially when media and political agendas seem to move on. We have to use our own power. You know, if this was 20 years ago, most people didn't walk around with computers in their purses and in their pockets. You know, each and every one of us, you know, has power to create uh, content um, and, and to actually then work together uh, in a communal way of, of helping to support that content uh, and continually getting that content out there. Now that content, of course, um, hopefully um, is anchored because you are working with uh, individuals who are dealing with whatever that particular uh, area, um, you know, of impact is or uh, of opportunity. And that's the other part, is that when we are dealing with and addressing, whether it is the climate crisis uh, or environmental injustices or these new sets of opportunities, um, that we have to make sure that we are sharing a, a pathway forward. Um, because that really helps people to, to, to connect. So I never shy away from the impact side of the equation, but I also want to make sure that folks understand that there are folks who are doing innovative work um, that often just don't get attention. Um, and, and then we also, you know, there are all these new sets of opportunities that we have. We don't have to have MSNBC or CNN or, or maybe one day Fox or a bunch of these other folks um, who are highlighting our stories. Um, we now have the opportunity to build our own uh, media opportunities, and but we just have to be willing to support each other um, to keep that information flowing. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we have another virtual question from Jessica. We've discussed a lot of domestic challenges so far, but I'd also love to hear your perspectives on international issues. Any thoughts on what the international community can do to include environmental justice in their policies? Mm -hmm. Without a doubt. I mean, it's all connected. You know, the, the things that are happening, you know, here in this country, you know, uh, are, are, the, are impacting what's happening in India and in China and in Brazil uh, in a laundry list of other countries that I could call out. And of course, the impacts that are happening on all of our island nations. Everything is interconnected. I mean, we have to make sure one, that we are building partnerships with the frontline organizations that are also in all those countries. What does that do? It also helps to leverage uh, for those conversations uh, and engagements that are necessary to get the governments to be able to you know, move forward in the direction that we all know needs to happen. We also got to get engaged with COP27. We saw what happened in COP26. Um, so you know, COP27 is one of our really last opportunities um, to really begin to move the needle. Um, so that means that all of this work that has to happen from this moment leading up to that um, is super important. And that's why we have to continue to build these relationships across the oceans um, to make sure that folks are standing in solidarity. We also, for those of us who have privilege, and privilege doesn't have to be a bad thing, it's how you utilize your privilege. We've got to make sure that uh, those countries and organizations um, you know, in other locations, if they don't have the financial resources that they need uh, to be able to fully engage and have the build out the capacity that they need. And that means that both ourselves and our institutions have to do a better job of helping to fund that. Um, and then, of course, there are the programs that we can create where, you know, some of us go over there and listen and learn and folks come here and listen and learn. And we have that cross pollinization and we have a much better understanding and honor uh, for the work that's happening in all these locations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. My name is Gaina Das. Mm -hmm. So you talked about the justice for the people, equality. Can you extend a little more from human to the entire universe or the nature, all different creatures, biodiversity. So recently I started uh, one non-profit organization called Think of Nature, thinkofnature.org. Mm -hmm. So your opinion on how to extend just from, not from human, rather all creatures, how mm -hmm. to live in harmony and live a sustainable life. 
Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for the question. You know, the first principle of environmental justice is focused on honoring Mother Earth. And then by honoring Mother Earth, we are talking about uh, both people uh, and animals uh, or people and wildlife and in all aspects of life on the planet. Um, so through an environmental justice paradigm, even though we have had to focus uh, on these disproportionate impacts that were happening uh, to communities, we also understood um, that we have to protect all life. Um, you know, when you look at the folks who have been protecting our forest um, and our jungles, they have been primarily black and brown folks um, who have been making sure that that work has been going on for millennia. Um, and we can go down the laundry list of, you know, the connections. Our indigenous brothers and sisters, uh, you know, whether in this country or across the world, you know, are, are connected um, to all of the aspects of life. It, it is a part of the cultural paradigm that folks operate from. And now we are even beginning to see in, in legislation um, the connections um, between, you know, of course, the climate crisis, environmental justice, uh, and, and the protection of public lands and spaces uh, and protecting wildlife. So folks are beginning to understand, you know, that we have to have a holistic uh, way of looking at these issues uh, and a holistic set um, of uh, opportunities and solutions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, now we have a question from Chris Field, the director of the Woods Institute. Mm -hmm. um, my question concerns your thoughts about service in the federal government. Mm -hmm. As someone who has had a distinguished career inside and outside government, how would you advise young people about the upsides and downsides of working in government? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I mean, working in the federal government, you know, um, it's an honor, right? So you learn a lot. Um, you get an opportunity um, to play a role. Uh, in helping to strengthen and protect your country, but you also have to understand that you are working inside of a bureaucracy. Um, and I, I had a conversation earlier with some folks, you know, that things sometimes don't move as quickly uh, inside of a government, whether it is a federal or a state government, um, as you would want it to. And you have to really be able to find the patience to deal with that, uh, especially, you know, because you got different different sets of things that are happening in the government. You've got some folks who are actually connected uh, to, to real folks on the ground. And then you have other folks who are doing some elements that are not as connected. And for those of us who are connected, um, you know, that can be a very frustrating situation. Um, but if you understand what the long game is, um, then you, sometimes you, you can navigate that. You know, on the outside, you have more flexibility. Um, you know, you can say what you need to say, I guess, depending on who you work for. I tell everybody, work for yourself. If you get that opportunity, start your own business. Um, but if that's not something that, that you're interested in, um, you also, you know, sometimes will have more resources on the outside, um, you know, that, that have more flexibility in being able to utilize those. So both um, have a lot of value. But, you know, if you're first coming out of school, I, you know, I, I think it's great um, to be able to, to have some federal service um, or state service. And the other part, unless something changes, uh, if you go into federal service, hopefully they can also help to pay off some of those student loans that continue to, you know, weigh folks down uh, for years and years. So that's another plus uh, on the federal side of the equation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Brian Kim. Uh, first off, I want to thank you for all your work on air, uh, air quality and air pollution, just because as someone that checks purple air pretty religiously, that's a great example of civilian sort of like crowdsourced mm -hmm. science that also helps implement like, hey, like how's the air quality in our place? Can, is it safe to go outside? And that sort of things. So, um, but touching on the point that you talked about regarding like the whole like money versus lives sort of a, a kind of conversation, um, mm -hmm. I like to kind of frame uh, most social problems, but especially climate change into like these three groups of consumers, citizens, like corporations and the government and this sort of like work inner workings between them, uh, those groups. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in me personally, as someone that works with corporations on like how their sustainable initiatives can actually make money for them while also like doing better for the environment. I'm curious if you have any learnings from how, you know, people are, have activism and for trying to enact these policies and how potentially their learnings on how they can influence 
corporate behavior and potentially if there's like a feedback loop they can do there in terms of like more corporations like pushing the sustainable initiatives because that's what the consumers want now mm -hmm. governments are now wanting to do policies because corporations want that too and they have a lot of unfortunately a lot of political power and, mm -hmm. and so forth and kind of steamrolling that way i mean there are lots of different ways of looking at that so first of all thank you for everything that you're doing um you know, as in relationship to communities, you know, they've been able to play a role in helping to push corporations uh, to do better in lots of different spaces. Now, there are some that, you know, just haven't yet evolved. You know, if you look at sort of the supply chain side of the equation, um, because of a number of different uh, frontline organizations and others, they've been able to get corporations. And of course, there's a bottom line aspect to it as well, to, to green um, a lot of their processes. Um, one of your former uh, uh, speakers, uh, Lisa Jackson, who I used to work for, you know, she's been really big uh, on the greening um, of a number of the different products um, uh, over at Apple and, and, and some others. Yeah, there's, there's still much more that, that needs to be done. So, so you found that. You've also found um, that there are some in the corporate space who've also been creating these uh, like environmental justice uh, advisory councils. Um, to have folks to be able to sit, um, work with people's boards, um, and then to also look at opportunities. Um, some of them have also, you know, began to do a lot better on public engagement um, and, and honoring some of the things that are coming out of that. That one example that I shared with you all about uh, Spartanburg, South Carolina, you know, there was a very contentious relationship there. I didn't go through all the examples because I know we were short on time, um, where uh, the... Uh, you know, the polluting industries that were there um, and the communities, they were, you know, they, they, were, they were butting heads. Um, and, and, and I can understand why the community felt that way. You know, they were getting sick and losing lives. There were cancers and liver and kidney diseases and all these other types of things for exposures. But I say all that to say that if you fast forward, um, they have a council now. Um, the doors have been opened um, and communities are, are playing a role um, and helping them to continue to green the industries that are there. Um, so uh, you have these, these, these opportunities where when folks are willing to sit down and find their commonalities, to, uh, to find these opportunities uh, to address uh, both, not just the impacts, but also the sets of opportunities, then you start to see uh, folks finding um, you know, some traction and beginning to move forward in a positive direction. Uh, there are lots of different ways that um, that, that various corporations um, can do better, um, and, and some of them are. I appreciate that. And a quick follow-up. Anywhere we can get in touch with you, I guess, if you want to share that. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can just answer that. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I couldn't tell you were walking away. Uh, yeah, it, it's pretty easy to get me. Um, you can go to Mustafa Santiago Ali. Um, uh, at um, or, or dot com, excuse me. Um, or if you're on social media, you can get me um, at EJ in action on Twitter um, or uh, Mustafa Santiago Ali uh, over at IG. Um, I'm not, I haven't really been doing the TikTok thing yet, but maybe next time. I think we'll have one Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Chris. I was just wondering, in your talk today, you talked about how communities speak for themselves, and um, you've also done a lot of work of like bringing together a caucus. And I was wondering, in terms of tips for going from a bunch of people, just because you live together doesn't necessarily make you a community, mm -hmm. and also like people from all over can also be considered a community. How mm -hmm. or what tips do you have in trying to take groups of strangers and showing those alignments or getting people to sit down with one another Mm -hmm. um, and allowing people a space to do so. Do you have any tips on how to, yeah, help mm -hmm. facilitate that? Yeah, get folks together around food and get folks together around music um, and, and then begin to, you know, just ask folks what their top three or four priorities are. What are the three or four things that you really care about that you'd like to see some things happening? Um, and, and different folks will, will begin to coalesce around some of the items. Um, and then you just, you know, do a, a very easy charrette or visioning session. Um, and people will begin to coalesce, coalesce together if you can get them together and, and, and help them to start to just think through their commonalities. We often think that, you know, these are, you know, uh, super difficult things to do. You just got to take your time. You got to give people the space to get comfortable with each other. Progress only moves um, as fast as people can trust each other. 
Um, so you got to give people the opportunity to be able to do that uh, and to trust you, um, if, if, you know, if you're a part of that mix. Um, and then you'll be able to start to build out. Uh, and then, then you have to start thinking critically about what are some of the short-term wins? Because if you're going to keep people together, people, if they're going to invest their time, um, which most people have a limited amount, um, they, they've got to see some wins. They got to know that their investment is yielding positive results. Um, and, and then you got something to work with. Uh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have uh, today for questions. Thank you again for holding space with us as we celebrate a decade of the Schneider Lecture. And thank you to Dr. Mastandrea and Dr. Santiago Ali for speaking. We would also like to take a moment to thank our co-sponsor, the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment. And of course, thank you once more to Dr. Terry Root, who has served as the driving force for the Schneider Lecture for a full decade. Mm -hmm. We hope to see these lectures for decades more, and today's talk has offered us one vision of what that work can look like as climate action moves forward into the future. Thank you so much for coming to the lecture, and we hope you all have a good evening. <laughs>